problems, they look around and see what's going on elsewhere, and they take the good ideas and put them into what they're doing. And so the fact that these evolved at the same time, you're going to have a lot of the same similarities between the two. So uh, by the way, let me, for those of you that haven't seen a picture of David Cutler, this is uh, myself and David Solomon at David Cutler's house a few weeks ago. He's in the middle, Dave Cutler's in the middle. And for those of you that haven't seen a picture of Linus, this is Linus. <laughs> Actually, this is um, Linus. I got dinged at this for Tech Ed US. People didn't like me showing this. They said that I was you know, being mean to Linus. But that Linus did this as a, uh, a dunking competition, a dunking ch for charity in Australia at Linux World earlier this year. And somebody posted this picture of him on the net. So I just thought it would be humorous. Now, when we were at David Cutler's house, I told him that I was presenting this at TechEd, and I said, David, you know, it'd only be fair if I show a picture of you in briefs at the, con at the conference, and can I take a picture of you like that? And of course, you can imagine his answer. So I don't have a picture of David Cutler like that for you to show you, but uh, I would if I could. So let's take a look at the architectures now. First of all, the broadest way you can categorize an operating system is how it divides up its work. And if you look at Windows and Linux from that point of view, they're both considered monolithic operating systems. That means that all of the core operating system services run in the same address space. And the easiest way to uh, kind of understand what I mean by that is to consider the total opposite of a monolithic operating system, which is called a microkernel operating system. Andrew Tannenbaum's Minix operating system, for example, is a microkernel-based operating system. And in that kind of operating system, the kernel itself is very tiny and provides a very core set of services. And other subsystems that you commonly think of as being part of the kernel, like the memory manager, the, the process manager, which does scheduling, they're running in their own address spaces. They look a lot like user mode programs. They look a lot like programs. The idea behind mon, uh, microkernel is that if one of those fails, you can restart it. They've got nice interfaces, so it's easy to replace uh, one of these modules with a different version that does, has a different implementation. The problem with a microkernel-based operating system is performance, because when they want to communicate with each other, they've got to transmit messages between each other, because they're in different address spaces. They can't read each other's memory. And that transmission of messages causes a performance hit. So most commercial operating systems are monolithic, including Windows and Linux. If you've heard of OS X, Apple's operating system, and know that it's based on the mock operating system from Carnegie Mellon, mock is a microkernel-based operating system. OS X takes the mock kernel and makes it into a monolithic operating system. So OS X really isn't an example of a microkernel-based operating system that you might think. Now, at the highest level, when you compare the two operating systems, what, the only real thing that you see is different is windowing, the way windowing is handled. So Windows has a kernel mode windowing subsystem, and Linux has a user mode X windowing system. So this is Windows the high-level architecture, where you've got the core set of drivers and services here executing in their shared address space in the kernel. You've got an application up here in user mode. When it wants to perform a graphics operation, like draw to the screen or create a window or create a menu, it does a call into the kernel, into the Win32 windowing subsystem. If you look at Win uh, Linux, the architecture looks like this, where you've got the application up here, and when it does a windowing call, it sends a message to the X window process, which is, looks like any other process, user mode process. Now, what are the advantages or disadvantages of, of these two approaches? Well, with this approach, you don't have a message. You have a simple transition from user mode to kernel mode, whereas here you've got messages that are being transmitted, which can degrade performance. And there's a lot of tricks that X windows does to try to minimize that. An advantage of the X windows approach is that it makes it very easy to remote an application, something you can't do on Windows. You can't run Word on, uh, remotely from another machine and see the window come up on a different machine. You've got a terminal server in and get a whole desktop is the only remote capability Windows has. And with X Windows, you can run apps, just the windows for the apps on a remote client. So that's an advantage there. So when we compare the architectures, I've, I've broken it down into various subsections. We're going to talk about processes and scheduling, symmetric multiprocessing support, memory management, the I.O. system, file caching, and security. In process management, well, the definition of a process in Windows is a container. And that container has a few things associated with it, including an address space that holds 
the code and data of the pro program that's being executed in that process. It also has a list of resources that are opened by that process. And resources can include files and registry keys. And it also has at least one thread. A thread is what actually executes the code, not the process. The process has to have a thread within it to execute. So the scheduler, when it decides who's going to run, will pick a thread to run. And that thread belongs to a process. So you can think of that process as running when it's actually a thread within that process. There's no inherent parent-child relationship between processes and their ch children processes they create in Windows. And threads, being the basic scheduling unit, are what the scheduler looks at. It looks at the priorities of the threads to decide what to pick next to run on the CPU. Windows also has what are called user mode threads, or lightweight threads, which are called fibers. And fibers are actually made without any support of the operating system itself. They're totally up in user space. It's where an application basically becomes its own scheduler. If you look at Linux, the process management there, uh, what you're going to see here on this first slide, uh, let me describe this to you, is the orange text are things that are different from Windows. So everything that's white is the same, and the things that are orange are different. So in Linux, though, when you talk about a process, it, things get a little confusing because of a design decision Linus took a few years ago. A process in Linux is known as a task. And the task looks like a Windows process. It has an address space. It has uh, a table of resources to open resources. And it has statistics. However, there is a parent-child relationship between tasks. When a, one task creates another task, that child task isn't going to terminate until somebody asks what its return status is, what its exit status is. By, de by default, that's supposed to be the parent task. Now, if a parent doesn't ask, Windows has this background daemon task that goes and just does that for the parent. It's also, however, the basic scheduling unit. So a task is the equivalent of a Unix, of a Windows process. A task is also the equivalent of a Windows thread. It depends on how the task was created. So let me explain this. In Windows, you've got a process, and that process has multiple threads. Those threads, if it's a multi-threaded process, share all the address space, share the resources of the process that they belong to. On Linux, you can have a task that has, it's composed of multiple tasks that all share the same address space, handle table, and so on. But if a task creates another task and says that it doesn't want to share anything with that other task, that task ends up looking like a new Windows process with one thread in it. The system call that's used to create a new task is called a clone. And the clone call tells the Linux what aspects of the parent task the child task is going to share. So basically, a task creating another task that shares nothing is the equivalent of creating a new process. And a task creating another task that shares everything is the Windows equivalent of creating a new thread. So there are no threads per se, even though I'm going to be referring to threads as we go through this talk just for clarity. When Linux also has P threads, which are cooperative Unix uh, user mode threads that uh, most recently were added and, and that are POSIX compliant, something that the Linux community is very happy about. So let's talk about scheduling now. When, how does the system decide what to run on the CPU? I mentioned that it has to do with priorities. And there's two scheduling classes on Windows, if you look at the priority spectrum. The top half is called the real time, or fixed priority range. Their priority number is 16 to 31, and the bottom half is priority numbers 1 to 15. And it's called the dynamic priority class. The reason that it's called dynamic and the top part is called fixed or real time is that the scheduler itself and the system can change the priorities of threads that are executing within that dynamic priority class. So the scheduler, for instance, will give a thread a boost if it wakes up waiting for an event and it's been sleeping for a while. And it gives it a boost to try to kind of be fair for that task that it's competing for CPU with other tasks that are just sitting there hogging the CPU. If you give the task that was sleeping a boost, now it has a better chance of running because its priority will likely be higher than those other ta uh, threads that were hogging the CPU. So the model is, and the real time, of course, that means that the scheduler is not going to be messing with the priorities of the threads running in that range. They're going to be left at whatever they were. Higher priorities are favored in, in Windows, as you've gathered. So 31 is the highest priority. Thread priorities are never lowered before the level they, below the level they started at. So if a thread starts out at priority 8, which is the default priority for a thread in Windows, and it gets a boost up to 10, it's eventually going to decay back down to 8. It will never be lowered below 8. 
Linux has three scheduling classes instead of two. The normal scheduling class is priority numbers 100 to 139, and then it has two fixed classes, one that's called fixed round robin, which internally are priorities 0 to 100, and fixed FIFO, which internally are priorities 0 to 100 as well. Normal is kind of like Windows dynamic range, where uh, tasks, Windows threads, that are or Linux threads that are executing that range can have their priorities modified. Now what's different is that the lower priority number is favored. So the highest priority on a Linux system is actually zero. In the normal class, it would be 100, would be the highest priority in the normal class. And thread priorities can go up and down instead of in Windows where they only can go up. They can, in Linux, go below their starting priority if they start out in the normal class. The way that Linux does this is by, as a, as a thread uses more and more CPU, its priority gets lowered, not in number, but in value. And so it has a less likely chance of getting scheduled, whereas the threads that are sleeping for a long time and not consuming the CPU, well, their, their uh, priorities are going to be raised. So it accomplishes the same goal as Windows does by trying to give those threads that aren't consuming CPU a better chance at getting the CPU by modifying their priorities. Now, I know a question that you've got probably right now and that you're going to have through the rest of this presentation is which of these approaches is better? And that's a very, very difficult question to answer, and I can't answer that, actually, because it depends on the workload and a whole bunch of other things. What, what I can say is, just looking at these two implementations, the Windows is, implementation is a lot more rigid. The Linux implementation is a lot more fluid, where priorities can go with, modi uh, be modified up and down and, and kind of track more closely how a process uses the how a task, rather, uses the CPU. When the scheduler decides to schedule a thread on a CPU, it gives that, schedule, uh, that thread a turn on the CPU, and that turn is called a quantum or time slice, after which, when that quantum or time slice expires, if the thread hasn't given up the CPU voluntarily, the scheduler will look and say, is there another thread that I should run on the CPU instead of you, another thread of the same priority? If a thread of a higher priority becomes able to run, the scheduler is going to go run that thread instead right away. But if there's no other higher priority thread, that thread is going to finish its quantum, the scheduler is going to wake up. And by default, this quantums or turns on a Windows system is 10 milliseconds, anywhere between 10 milliseconds and 120 milliseconds. Actually, there's several preset values in that range. And the value, the reason I can't tell you which value Windows uses is it depends on a number of factors. First of all, whether you're on a professional system or a works uh, server system, and second, how you've configured the system to tune itself. If you're on a server system, by default, all the threads have 120 millisecond time slices. If you're on a workstation system, there's two priorities usually involved. One for foreground threads, where foreground threads, I mean the threads that own windows that are visible to you on the desktop, those threads will have longer quantums than threads that are in the background. And those threads might have 120 millisecond or 60 millisecond quantum. The threads in the background might have lower 10, 20, 10 or 20 millisecond quantums. The scheduler itself is reentrant re and preemptible. And what that means is that the, if you've got a multiprocessor system, the scheduler can be running on multiple CPUs making decisions about scheduling for the operating system. And it's preemptible as well, the kernel. So if, what that means is if you enter the kern in kernel mode, and this, the uh, thread's executing in kernel mode, the, sched the scheduler can stop that thread, freeze it, and then switch execution to another thread.